Hello and welcome back to a chapter a day with Miss Petals. I'm Miss Petals and a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. So continuing from our story in review, Montag was sharing a script, not scripture, sorry, a poem to the ladies of his wife Mildred's friends, the ladies that you sh- that are also f- family addicted. Hold on, let me sorry, let me uh, straighten this camera real quick so it won't wave so much. And we found out that even the ladies were disturbed by it, were upset about it, and then. We ended with Montag, Mr. Faber, I assume, yes, telling Montag that he shouldn't be mad at these people for not understanding or understanding how he's feeling about the poem, about the poetry, or about reading in general, or having thoughts, because he used to be like that. So he has to keep in mind that these people don't know or understand what's really going on and that's where we ended it last time also I wanted to pose a question of why Montag he had so many books in his house but yet he wanted to copy the he wanted to copy the Bible and I thought about it over our brief break I was like, why the Bible? And maybe you guys can give me your, share your thoughts on why the Bible when he had so many other books. And for those of you who don't understand or don't know the scripture that Montag was trying to remember on the train and when he went to first to Faber's house, it is from Luke. And I will read it to you. Luke twelve twenty seven. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I'm sorry for the delay. There is a really, really long delay. So I want to keep this up for a minute. But I want us to think during our reading why this scripture is so important to Montag is it because it's the only one left does it have meaning and for those of you who want to dive in deeper I'd also read Luke 12 28 because this scripture is about talking about how God is in control and how even in all of Solomon's glory, the, he, God still even, he still, excuse me, I'm losing my train of thought, y'all. I'm sorry. He still keeps the lilies. He still takes care of them. So man has nothing to worry about if he trusts in God. Also, I would also like to share, like during my, during the weekend, a friend of mine posted a post of somebody else's post, (laughs) if that makes sense. Um, They posted a clip from a movie called My Dinner with Andre. And I've never watched this film. This was, this film was brought out in 1981. So I watched it. And we're going to watch it in a few minutes. And it is Fahrenheit 451, what we're reading in a nutshell. It is Montag's world in a nutshell. And then what's happening to our world in a nutshell. And it was amazing how this was done in 1981, guys. 1981. And I'm watching it in 20. 20- 21 this was supposed to be humorous but it's actually really scary 
So I'm going to share this clip with you all. And then we'll get started with our reading for today. Well, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why is that? I mean, is it just because people are, are lazy today or they're bored? I mean, are we just like bored, spoiled children who've just been lying in the bathtub all day, just playing with their plastic duck, and now they're just thinking, well, what can I do? <laughs> okay, yes, we are bored. We're all bored now. But has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money, and that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks? And it's not just a question of individual survival, Wally, but that somebody who's bored is asleep, and somebody who's asleep will not say no? See, I keep meeting these people. I mean, uh, just a few days ago, I met this man whom I greatly admire. He's a Swedish physicist, Gustav Bjornstrand. And he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines. He's completely cut them out of his life because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now and that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. Oh my gosh, guys, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I didn't even know my mic was off. I apologize. I was saying <laughs> earlier, I had to stop the clip because YouTube would not allow me to play it. So they temporarily blocked my view. And I forgot to turn my mic on. But um, you can check out the clip on YouTube or you can go to the Seeds of Harvest Library and I will say this again on their Facebook page oops 
Seeds of Harvest Library, 4121 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana, inside Market City, Friday and Sunday, 1030 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Saturday, 1030 a.m. to 430 p.m. Donations are accepted. Hardcover books only. Also, you can follow them on social media. Once again, I am so sorry, guys. I am such a noob at live stream. So, uh, hopefully I'll still have some, well, you know, I have more, uh, viewers on my rumble page than I do on YouTube, but hey, we're, so we're just gonna continue reading from Fahrenheit 451 where we left off. Once again, I'm sorry. I did not even realize my mic was off. probably you guys were probably and I lost my page oh uh, you pro guys are probably like I can't hear her what's going on here we go pity Montag pity don't haggle and nag them you were so recently of them yourself they are so confident that they, they will run on forever but they won't run on they don't know that this is all one huge big blazing meteor that makes a pretty fire in space, but that someday it'll have to hit. They see only the blaze, the pretty fire as you saw it. Montag, old men who stay at home, afraid, tending their peanut brittle bones, have no right to criticize, yet you almost kill things at the start. Watch it. I'm with you. Remember that. I understand how it happened. I must admit that your blind raging invigorated me. God, how young I felt. But now I want you to feel old. I want a little of my cowardice to be distilled in you tonight. The next few hours when you see Captain Beatty tiptoe around him. Let me hear him for you. Let me feel the situation out. Survival is our ticket. Forget the poor silly women. I made them unhappier than they have been in years, I think, said Montag. It shocked me to see Miss Phelps cry. Maybe they're right. Maybe it's best not to face things, to run, have fun. I don't know. I feel guilty. You know you mustn't. If there were no war, if there was peace in the world, I'd say fine, have fun. But Montag, you mustn't go back to being just a fireman. All isn't well with the world. Montag perspired. Montag, you listening? My feet, said Montag. I can't move them. I feel so damn silly. My feet won't move. Listen, easy now, said the old man gently. I know, I know, you're afraid of making mistakes. Don't be. Mistakes can be profited by. Man, when I was younger, I shoved my ignorance in people's faces. They beat me with sticks. By the time I was 40, my blunt instrument had been honed to a fine cutting point for me. If you hide your ignorance, no one will hit you and you'll never learn. Now pick up your feet into the firehouse with you. We're twins. We're not alone anymore. We're not separated out in different parlors with no contact between. If you need help, when Beatty pries at you, I'll be sitting right here in your eardrum making notes. Montag felt his right foot, then his left foot move. Old man, 
he said. Stay with me. The mechanical hound was gone. Its kennel was empty, and the firehouse stood all about in plaster silence. And the orange salamander slept with its kerosene in its belly, and the fire throwers crossed upon its flanks, and Montag came in through the silence and touched the brass pole and slid up in the dark air. Looking back at the deserted kennel, his heart beating, pausing, beating, Faber was a gray moth, asleep in his ear for the moment. Beatty stood near the drop hole, waiting, but with his back turned as if he were not waiting. Well, he said to the men playing cards, here comes a very strange beast, which in all tongues is called a fool. He put his hand to one side, palm up for a gift. Montag put the book in it, without even glancing at the title. Beatty tossed the book in the trash basket and lit a cigarette. Who are a little wise, the best fools be? Welcome back, Montag. I hope you'll be staying with us now that your fever is done and your sickness over. Sit in for a hand of poker. They sat and the cards were dealt. In Beatty's sight, Montag felt the guilt of, the, of his hands. His fingers were like ferrets that had done some evil and now never rested. Always stirred and picked in hot and hid in pockets, moving from under Beatty's alcohol flame, stare. If Beatty so much as breathed on them, Montag felt that his hands might wither, turn over on their sides, and never be shocked to life again. They would be buried the rest of his life in his coat sleeves forgotten. For these were the hands that had acted on their own. No part of him here was where the conscience first manifested itself to snatch books, dart off with Job and Ruth and Willie Shakespeare. And now in the firehouse, these hands seemed gl loved with blood twice and a half an hour monta had to rise from the game to go to the latrine to wash his hands when he came back he hid his hands under the table beady laughed let's have your hands in sight montag not that we don't trust you understand but they all laughed well said beady the crisis is past and all is well. The sheep returns to the fold. <coughs> We're all sheep who have strayed at times. Truth is truth. To the end of reckoning, we've cried. They are never alone that are accompanied with noble thoughts. We've shouted to ourselves, sweet food of sweetly uttered knowledge. Sir Philip Sidney said, but on the other hand, words are like leaves and where, and where they most abound. Much fruit of sense beneath is rarely found. Alexander Pope. What do you think of that, Montag? I don't know. Careful, whisper Faber, living in another world far away. Or this, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Their shallow droughts intoxicate the brain and, drink and drinking largely sobers us again. Pope, same essay. Where does that put you? Montag bit his lip. I'll tell you, said Beatty, smiling at his cards. That made you, for a little while, a drunkard. Read a few lines and off you go, over the cliff. Bang! You're ready to blow up the world, chop off heads, knock down women and children, destroy authority. I know. I've been through it all. I'm all right said Montag nervously. Stop blushing. I'm not needling. Really, I'm not. Do you know I had a dream an hour ago? 
I lay down for a cat nap, and in this dream, you and I, Montag, got into a furious debate on books. You towered with rage, yelled quotes at me. I calmly per parried every thrust. Power, I said, and you, quoting Dr. Johnson, said, knowledge is more than equivalent to force. And I said, well, Dr. Johnson also said, dear boy, that he is no wise man that will quit a certainty for an uncertainty. Stick with the fireman, Montag. All else is dreary chaos. Don't listen, whispered Faber. He's trying to confuse. He's slippery. Watch out. Beatty chuckled, and you said, quoting, Truth will come to light. Murderer will not be hid long. And I cried in good humor, Oh God, he speaks only of his horse. And the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. And you yelled, this age thinks better of a gilded fool than of a tread than of a threadbare saint in wisdom school. And I whispered gently, the dignity of truth is lost with much protesting. And you screamed, carcasses bleed at the sight of the murderer. And I said, patting your hand, what do I know? What do I give, you trench mouth? And you shrieked, knowledge is power. And a dwarf on a giant's shoulder sees the furthest of the two. And I summed my side up with a rare sincerity. In it, in the folly, the folly of mistaking a metaphor for a proof, a torrent of a ver, a verbiage for a spring of capital truths, and oneself as an oracle is inborn in us. Mister Valerie once said. Montag's head whirled sickeningly. He felt beaten unmercifully on brow. Eyes, nose, lips, chin, on shoulders, on upflailing arms. He wanted to yell. No! Shut up! You're confusing things! Stop it! Beatty's graceful fingers thrust out to seize his wrist. God, what a pulse! I've got you going, have I, Montag? Jesus, God, your pulse sounds like the day after the war. everything but sirens and bells shall i talk some more i like your look of panic swahili indian english lit i speak them all a kind of excellent dumb discourse willie montag hold on the moth brushed montag's ear he's muddying the waters Oh, you were scared silly, said Beatty, for I was doing a terrible thing in using the very books you clung to to rebut you on every hand, on every point. What traitors books can be? You think they're backing you up and they turn on you? Others can use them, too. And there you are, lost in the middle of the moor in a great welter of nouns and verbs and adjectives, and at the very end of my dream along I came with the salamander and said, Going my way? And you got in, and we drove back to the firehouse in a beat it thick silence, all dwindled away to peace. Beady, let Montex wrist go. Let the hand slump limply on the table. All's well that is well in the end. Silence. Montag sat like a carved white stone. The echo of the final hammer on his skull died slowly away into the black cavern where Faber waited for the echoes to subside. And then when the startled dust had settled down about Montag's mind, Faber began softly, all right, he's had his say. You must take it in. I'll say my say, too, in the next few hours. And you'll take it in, and you'll try to judge them and make your decisions as to which way to jump or fall. But I want it to be your decision, not mine. 
and not the captain's. But remember that the captain belongs to the most dangerous enemy to truth and freedom, the solid, unmoving cattle of the majority. Oh God, the terrible tyranny of the majority. We all have our harps to play, and it's up to you now to know with which ear you'll listen. Montag opened his mouth to f- answer Faber, and was saved this error in the presence of others when the station bell rang. The alarm voice in the ceiling chanted. There was a tacking sound as the alarm report telephone typed out the address across the room. Captain Beatty, his poker cards in one pink hand, walked with exaggerated slowness to the phone and ripped out the address when the report was finished. He glanced perfunctorily at it and shoved it in his pocket. He came back and sat down. The others looked at him. It can wait exactly 40 seconds while I take all the money away from you, said Beatty happily. Montag put his cards down. Tired, Montag? Going out of this game? Yes. Hold on. Well, come to think of it, we can finish this hand later. Just leave your cards face down and hustle the equipment. On the double now. And Beatty rose up again. Montag, you don't look well. I'd hate to think you were coming down with another fever. I'll be all right. You'll be fine. This is a special case. Come on, jump for it. They leaped into the air and clutched the brass pole as if it were the last vantage point above a tidal wave, passing below and then the brass pole to their dismay, slid de- slid them down into darkness, into the blast and cough and suction of the gaseous, gaseous dragon roaring to life. Hey! They rounded a corner in thunder and siren with conscious sorry, with concussion of tires, with scream of rubber, with a shift of kerosene, bulk in the glittery brass tank like the food in the stomach of a giant, with Montag's fingers jolting off the silver rail, swinging into cold space, with the wind tearing his hair back from his head, with the wind whistling in his teeth and in him and him all the while thinking of the women, the chaff women in his parlor tonight, with the kernels blown out from under them by a neon wind and his silly damned reading of a book to them. How like trying to put out fires with water pistols. How senseless and insane. One rage turned in for another. One anger displacing another. When would he stop being entirely mad and be quiet, be very quiet indeed. Here we go. Montag looked up. Beatty never drove, but he was driving tonight, slamming the salamander around corners, leaning forward high on the driver's throne, his massive black slicker flapping out behind so that he seemed to gr- seemed a great black bat flying o- flying above the engine over the brass numbers taking the full wind here we go to keep the world happy montag beady's pink phosphorescent cheeks glimmered in the high darkness and he was smiling furiously here we are the salamander boomed to a halt throwing men off in slips and clumsy hops Montag stood fixing his raw eyes to the cold, bright rail under his clenched fingers. I can't do it, he thought. How can I go at this new assignment? How can I go on burning things? I can't go in this place. Beady smelling of the wind through which he had rushed was at Montag's elbow. All right, Montag. The men ran like cripples in their clumsy boots, as quietly as spiders. 
At last, Montag raised his eyes and turned. Beatty was watching his face. Something the matter, Montag? Why, said Montag slowly, we've stopped in front of my house. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just being, I'm being silly. We're on part three, the burning bright, burning bright. <clears throat> Lights flicked on and house doors opened all down the street to watch the carnival set up. Montag and Beatty stared, one with dry satisfaction, the other with disbelief. At the house before them, this main ring in which torches would be juggled and fire eaten. Well, said Beatty, now you did it. Old Montag wanted to fly near the sun, and now that he's burnt his damn wings, he wonders why. Didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound around your place? Montag's face was entirely numb and featureless. He felt his head turn like a stone carving to the dark place next door, set in its bright border of flowers. Beatty snorted. <laughs> oh no, you weren't fooled by that little idiot's routine, now were you? Flowers, butterflies, leaves, sunsets. Oh, hell, it's all in her file. I'll be damned. I've hit the bullseye. Look at the sick look on your face. A few grass blades and the quarters of the moon. What trash. What good did she ever do with all of that? Talking about Clarice. Montag sat on the cold fender of the dragon, moving his head half an inch to the left, half an inch to the right, left, right, left, right, left. She saw everything. She didn't do anything to anyone. She just let them alone. Alone, hell! She chewed around you, didn't she? One of those damn do-gooders with their shocked, holier-than-thou silences, their one talent making others feel guilty. God damn, they rise like the midnight sun to sweat you in your bed. The front door opened. Mildred came down the steps, running out, running one suitcase held with a dreamlike clenching rig rigidity in her fist as a beetle taxi hissed to the curb. Mildred! She ran past with her body stiff, her face flowered with pow powder, her mouth gone without lipstick. Mildred, you didn't put in the alarm! She shoved the val valise in the waiting be beetle, climbed in, and sat mumbling. Poor family. Poor family. Oh, everything gone. Everything, everything gone now. Beatty grabbed Montag's shoulders as the beetle blasted away and hit 70 miles an hour far down the street, gone. There was a crash like the falling parts of a dream fashioned out of warped glass mirrors and crystal prisms. Montag drifted about as if Still, another incomprehensible storm had turned him to see stone men and black wielding axes shattering window panes to provide cross ventilation. The brush of a death's head moth against a cold black screen. Montag, this is Faber. Do you hear me? What's happening? This is happening to me, said Montag. What a dreadful surprise, said Beatty, for everyone nowadays knows absolutely is certain that nothing will ever happen to me. Others die, I go on. There are no consequences and no responsibilities, except that there are. 
but let's not talk about them, eh? By the time the consequences catch up with you, it's too late, isn't it, Montag? Montag, can you get away? Run? asked Faber. Montag walked but did not feel his feet touch the cement and then the night grasses. Beady flicked his igniter nearby and the small orange flame drew his fascinated gaze. What is there about fire that's so lovely? No matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Beady blew out the flame and lit it again. It's perpetual motion, the thing man wanted to invent but never did. Or almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it'd burn our lifetimes out. What is fire? It's a mystery. Scientists give us a gobbledygook about friction and molecules, but they don't really know. Its real beauty is that it destroys responsibility and consequences. A problem gets too burdensome, then into the furnace with it. Now, Montag, you're a burden, and fire will lift you off my shoulders, clean, quick, and sure. Nothing to rot later. Antibiotic, a aesthetic, practical. Montag stood looking in now at this queer house made strange by the hour of the night, by murmuring neighbor voices, by littered glass, and they're on the floor, their covers torn off and spilled out like swan feathers, the incredible books that look so silly and really not worth bothering with, for these were nothing but black type and yellowed paper and raveled binding. Mildred, of course, she must have watched him hide the books in the garden and brought them back in. Mildred, Mildred, I want you to do this job all by your lonesome, Montag. Not with kerosene and a match, but piecework with a flamethrower. Your house, your cleanup. Montag, can't you run, get away? No, cried Montag helplessly. The hound, because of the hound. Faber heard, and Beatty, thinking it was meant for him, heard, yes, the hound somewhere about the neighborhood, so don't try anything. Ready? Ready, Montag snapped the safety catch on the flamethrower. Fire! A great nuzzling gout of fire le leapt out to lap at the books and knock them against the wall. He stepped into the bedroom and fired twice, and the twin beds went up in great simmering whisper with more heat and passion and light than he would have supposed them to contain. He burnt the bedroom walls and the cosmetics chest because he wanted to change everything, the chairs, the tables, and in the dining room, the silverware and plastic dishes, everything that showed that he had lived here in this empty house with a strange woman who would forget him tomorrow, who had gone and quite forgotten him already, listening to her seashell radio pour in on her and in on her as she rode across town alone. And as before, it was good to burn. He felt himself gush out in the fire, snatch, rend, rip in half with flame, and put away the senseless problem. If there was no solution, well then, now there was no problem. Either fire was best for everything. The books, Montag! The books leapt and danced like roasted birds, their wings ablaze with red and yellow feathers. And then he came to the parlor where the great idiot monsters lay asleep with their white thoughts and their snowy dreams, and he shot a bolt at each of the three blank walls and the vacuum hissed out at him. The emptiness made an even emptier whistle, a senseless scream. 
He tried to think about the vacuum upon which the nothingness had performed, but he could not. He held his breath so the vacuum could not get into his lungs. He cut off his terrible emptiness, drew back, and gave the entire room a gift of one huge bright yellow flower of burning. The fireproof plastic sheath on everything was cut wide, and the house began to shudder with flame. When you're quite finished, said Beatty behind him, you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in sleepy pink-gray cinders, and a smoke plume blew over it, rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was three thirty in the morning. The crowd drew back into the houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble, and the show was well over. Montag stood with the flamethrower in his limp hands, great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits, his face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illumined illumined faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice and then finally managed to put his thoughts together. Was it my wife? Turned in the alarm. Beatty nodded. But her friends turned in an alarm earlier that I let ride. One way or the other, you'd have got it. It was pretty silly, quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. You think you can walk on water with your books? Well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you in slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Monk Ted could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house, and Mildred was under there somewhere, and his entire life under there, and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him, and he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beatty hit him without raising a hand. Hold on. Montag, you idiot! Montag, you damn fool! Why did you really do it? Montag did not hear. He was far away. He was running with his mind. He was gone, leaving this dead, soot-covered body to sway in front of another raving fool. Montag, get out of there, said Faber. Montag listened. Beatty struck him a blow on the head that sent him reeling back. The green bullet in which Faber's voice whispered and cried, fell to the sidewalk. Beatty snatched it up, grinning. He held it half in, half out of the e out of his ear. Montag heard the distant voice calling, Montag, you all right? Beatty switched the green bullet off and thrust it in his pocket. Well, so there's more here than I thought. I saw you tilt your head listening. First I thought you had a seashell, but when you turned clever later i wondered we'll trace this and drop it drop in on your friend no said montag he twitched the safety catch on the flamethrower Beatty glanced instantly at montag's fingers and his eyes widened the faintest bit montag saw the surprise there and himself glanced to his hands to see what new thing they had done Thinking back later, he could never decide whether the hands or Beatty's reaction to the hands gave him the final push toward murder. The last rolling thunder of the avalanche stoned down about his ears, not touching him. Beatty grinned, his most charming grin. Well, that's one way to get an audience. 
hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to your speech. Speech away. What'll it be this time? Why don't you belch Shakespeare at me? You fumbling snob. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as an idle wind, which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now, you second-hand literaneer. Literature. Pull the trigger. He took one step toward Montag. Montag only said, We never burned right. Hand it over, guy, said Beatty with a fixed smile. And then he was a... And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin, no longer human or known, all withering flame on the lawn. As Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him, there was a hiss like a great mouthful of spittle banging a red-hot stove, a bubbling and frothing as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail a ca to cause a terrible liquefaction and a boiling over of yellow foam. Montag shut his eyes, shouted, shouted, and fought to get his hands at his ears to clamp and to cut away the sound. Beatty flopped over and over and over and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. The other two firemen did not move. Montag kept his sickness down long enough to aim the flamethrower. Turn around! They turned their faces like blanched meat, streaming sweat. He beat their hands, excuse me, They he beat their heads, knocking off their helmets and bringing them down on themselves. They fell and lay without moving. The blowing of a single autumn leaf he turned, and the mechanical hound was there. It was half across the lawn, coming from the shadows, moving with such drifting ease that it was like a single solid cloud of black-gray smoke blown at him in silence. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down at Montag from a good three feet over his head, its spider legs reaching the procane needle snapping out its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of fire, a single wondrous blossom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog. Clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him ten feet back against the bowl of a tree. Taking the flame gun with him, he felt it scrabble and seize his leg and stab the needle in for a moment before the fire snapped. The hound up in the air burst its metal bones at the joints and blew out its interior in a single flushing of red color like a sky rocket fastened to the street. Montag lay watching the dead alive thing fiddle the air and die. Even now it seemed to want to get back at him and finish the injection, which was now working through the flesh of his leg. He felt all of the mingled relief and horror at having pulled back only in time to have just his knee slammed by the fender of a car, hurtling by a 90 miles an hour. He was afraid to get up, Afraid he might not be able to gain his feet at all when it, with an anesthetized leg. A numbness in a numbness hollowed into a numbness. And now, the street empty, the house burnt like an ancient bit of stage scenery. The other homes dark, the hound here, beady there, the three other firemen another place and the salamander he gazed at the immense engine 
that would have to go too. Well, he thought, let's see how badly off you are on your feet now. Easy, easy, there. And we're going to stop right there for today. Oh, wow. Would you guys do the same thing? I don't know. I <laughs> Killing the guy with a flamethrower. But the ha he couldn't run because the hound was there. So it turns out that BD had the hound on Montag the whole time. And he, it even came by the house. Wow. Oof, there's so much I wanted to cover, you guys, but... Man, what, what about Mildred? She just got up out of there, didn't she? She ratted on her husband and just went and completely forgot about him. But if we're really honest with ourselves, she, she pretty much did forget all about him, even when he was there. And... Oof. Makes me think Beatty had it in for Montag the whole time. And it sounds like he did. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen to Faber. And what's going to happen to him. So he killed a man. Burnt him alive. I think that would be the only option you could do. I hope he didn't burn the other man. Well, it sounds like he's getting ready to burn the fire the fire truck too. Man. And when I when we found out that he was going to burn his own house, man, what a twist. But it makes you think. Do you think do you, do you all think that this is where we're headed? Are we... Mm -mm -mm. Is this where we're headed, y'all? Anybody who disagrees? And what Faber said about what the real enemy is, he's part, is the majority. Wow, that just hit home. Right now, our country is divided. And those who oppose or stand up for righteousness sake, as the Bible, as I'm paraphrasing a scripture from the Bible, they're seen as enemies. They're seen as, like, how dare you have a thought? How dare you think differently than what we all think? Individuality in Montag's world is no thing. Everybody is supposedly equal. That's what makes people happy, but I mean, guys, so far we're we're almost done with this book. And I want you all to think what makes you all happy? And you're like, "What? I mean, like what does that have to do with the book?" It does. I mean, what is happiness to you? Because in this book, they're thinking that everybody's equal, everybody being equal, no individuality, no, um, no conflict, no, because books bring conflict and don't write anything, you know, just be interested in sports entertainment and, you know, that's all life should be. And that's what makes people happy. But does it, these people aren't happy in this, but in this world. They're not happy. They're killing each other at night. And they and they are uh, killing themselves at night. And they're ratting on each other. <laughs> and having intellectual thought is seen as being a snob. Do you see that in today's world? Let's think on that. And... Really, tonight, I want you to think about what is happiness? What's happiness to you? And 
is Montag's world really happy? I mean, we just saw the man, oh, well, in our imaginations, we saw the man burn alive uh, Beatty, which I think most people would have done, if I'm honest. And if I'm honest with you all, I think I would do the same thing. I would have done the same thing, even though I'm a Christian. <laughs> but, um, because there was no other way. He didn't have any other weapons. He couldn't run. I think that's what I would have done. Even though I don't believe in killing anybody. But, hey, that's another thing to think about. Would y'all do the same thing? Let me know. And like I said earlier, also think about why is that scripture so important? Like we read, this is a Montag scripture. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Let that scripture be. Let's think about that scripture for next time. And why, why that scripture? Why that particular scripture? You might think that we think that you may think. Well, like that Montag chose to remember. And that's all for tonight. I want to thank you all. I'm sorry that you couldn't see the clip. I really wanted you to see that clip so we can talk about it. But, you know, YouTube, it's, they say it's copyright. So, um, like I said, you can watch. The clip was from a dinner with my dinner with Andre. It was made in 1981. And you can watch it. You can watch the whole movie on YouTube don't know why they won't let me play the clip but they can play the whole movie like on there you can watch the whole movie there or you can watch the clip the full clip that i was going to show on the seeds of harvest library facebook page so until next time this has been a chapter a day with miss petals and remember a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play so i'll see you guys soon